probably one thing, looking back on it, there are really three time scales in dealing with this. And the first one, one is air, one is surface water, and one is groundwater. The air time scale is the quickest because uh, air moves with the speed of the wind, literally, <laughs> which can be up to 60 kilometers an hour. And you can't live without air for more than a minute. And if you inhale something that is very irritating or toxic, the way those fumes were, uh, you have to get out of it immediately. So the first focus was on the smoke, on the air that was blowing down wind. We did get fairly lucky in that the wind speed was low on the first day of the fire. The fire was so hot that the hot air plume rose up very high. Uh, so that it rose up probably within about 50 meters of the fire itself, went up about, oh, up to about 300 meters high and then stayed up on a plume, which gave us the opportunity to get the people moved out and evacuated up to three or four kilometers around the immediate fire site. Within a day or two after that, the wind began to blow much harder and the plume began to move around. The wind speed did get up to 60 kilometers an hour. And what happened was that blew the smoke out along the ground. And at one point, we had to evacuate up to 15 kilometers away to the northeast of the fire. And that's literally thousands of people on a long way. Um, once we got the evacuation stuff more or less under control and uh, the firefighters were fighting the fire close in, they had developed a method which they called the barn method of firefighting. They say in Hagersville that you can't fight a barn fire just by putting water on it. Uh, you have to get into the barn and pull out the bales and put them out and turn them over with the backhoe and then put them out on the other side. That's the method they decided to use to put out the fire, and it was enormously successful. They had the help of the water bombers from the Ministry of Natural Resources, but it was really done on the ground. Uh, the volunteer firefighters worked out for the first week, and uh, they were doing their normal jobs and then working a six-hour volunteer firefighting stint, and they were exhausted by the end of the first week. And at that point, they called in the provincial firefighters, the, uh, the forest fire, firefighters who worked with the water bombers. And the water bombers were very impressive. I mean, they could just come in, they could just lay it on one of these tables like they were that accurate. In the meantime, we were looking after the environmental aspects of it, and the strategy that developed was to hit the fire as hard as possible, get it out as fast as possible, contain the site at the same time so the contamination did not get off site. We couldn't do anything about the smoke uh, except evacuate people, but uh, we did concentrate on making the air measurements and estimations so that we knew where we could evacuate people, where it would be safe, where it would not be safe, which was vital information in the first place of the fire. The next thing that we had to look at was the water runoff. We diked the water and we separated it. There was some oil with it, not much in the first few days of the fire. And we recycled the water back up onto the fire because this is out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not even Hagersville, you know, it's out in the middle of the countryside. Uh, it was a problem getting enough water to fight the fire and the foam to fight the fire. So we built our collection system to contain all the firefighting runoff water and put it back onto the fire to help put the fire out. Um, what we were finding was after the first four or five days that oil started to come out of the fire because tires are made largely of oil as well as some other things. Unfortunately, there's an oil refinery nearby, and they had sent up a big pumper truck because they thought we might need help with the oil, and they had a big tank right down in Mantico, and we just pumped the oil out. As it came out, we separated it from the water and sent it down to Nantico, where it's still sitting in the tank, so that all these dire predictions of it's going to be like the Exxon Valdez just didn't happen because we got the oil, we stayed ahead of it, we pumped it out, and we kept re-pumping the water on the fire. And then it began to rain. When it rains, as it did a few days ago, you get about a half a million gallons of water. All little raindrops, but it adds up to a lot. Half a million gallons of water falls on that site. It comes down to the bottom end of it, it soaks through. And we had to get some people in to build a water treatment plant in the field just south of the road to let the fire. That's normally something that would take about a year to build, but we managed to do it, I guess, in about a week and a half because the water was coming off so fast. <coughs> The ground water is the second time scale I want to talk about, or the, the surface water. Because the surface water moves at the speed of the stream, which is about a kilometer per hour. So you have more time 
to dike off the area of the back and make sure that the tile drains in the field are closed off and so on. That's still going on. Every time it rains on the site, there's still contaminated material there. And the rainwater that falls on it gets contaminated, so we have to either pump it away or else treat it, which we're continuing to do. Actually, we're, we're revamping the water treatment plant right now so it can treat the water better. The third time scale is the ground water, the, the water that sinks down into the ground. And the problem with that is they don't really know what's underneath the ground. When we started, we knew there was limestone underneath there, which tends to have lots of cracks in it, so oil and contaminated water can move through it. But it moves relatively slowly, about a kilometer per year. So that's the third time scale. We figured if we could get in, get the fire out quickly, we'd have time to deal with the groundwater contamination before it reached any of the neighboring wells. We're testing the nearest wells once a week, the next ring of wells, uh, sorry, nearest wells were once a week, were three times a week, the next wells once a week, and after that we have a pattern of wells. We have found no contamination in any of the wells near the site. Part of the reason for that is that our hydrogeologist, the guy who knows about the water underneath the ground, in the first few days, we knew there was oil underneath the fire. And we didn't know where it was going because it wasn't coming out. We were afraid it was going straight down to the deep water where people take their water from from the wells. So Bill Blackport, he took a front end loader and he went and he dug shallow holes all around the site to try to find out which way the underground water was flowing. And he came back to me and he said, Dennis, I think we really have to take a chance on this. He said, I am sure there is oil underneath there. He says, I don't know where it's going. The longer the fire burns, the more the oil will build up in a big pancake underneath the fire, and it will build up pressure, which will force the oil down to the deep ground water. And he said, we have to get out of there. He said, I'm suggesting that we dig a holding pole at the south end of the site so we can try to collect some of the soil. So he said, will it make things worse? Like if you dig down, would you be providing a route for the oil to get somewhere where it wouldn't have gone before? And he looked up and he said, there is nothing we're going to do that's going to make this any worse than this already. He said, this is so bad. He says, I don't think we can make it worse. I said, go ahead, start digging. And there was a lot of there's a lot of situations like that. And you know, I talked about the different skills that some people plan and think ahead, and some people are good at living with the moment. And I think the reason I maintained my sanity through all of this is that I am one of those people who can't live in the moment. That means there are things that I don't see that are going to happen in three weeks' time, but there are other people who do see that. We can work together, it works well. I think if someone who had to a very planned approach would have gone crazy in the first few days, then because you never knew from moment to moment what was going to happen. So I said to Bill, go ahead, dig, and thought, ah, I hope he's right. He was absolutely right. He dug a huge holding pond, 100 feet by 300 feet, and as they dug the corner closest to the fire and got down to the bedrock, the oil just spurted out of there. I don't know if you've seen, you know, Jed Clampett and the Beverly Hillbillies where he shoots into the bank and the oil. It's only the teachers that really remember this. And uh, it was just like that. The oil just burst out. And uh, we used that to continue to drain the underside oil. And we're finding now as we drill underneath the site, there's very little oil left in probably two or three. So again, big sigh of relief, that was one of the things that worked out.